This module is probably the most technically demanding and mathematical module in this course. So please grab yourself a pen and paper and calculator and feel free to pause the video, rewind it to make sure that you fully understand the way the process works. So let's jump in. During the testing phase of our improvement cycles, whether that be the DMEC process or PDCA, we want to be sure that the results we have achieved are indeed genuine improvements. There is a possibility that the changes measured in results are actually just down to random variation. In other words, the result is null. In hypothesis testing, we're aiming to evaluate our test results to see if they are statistically significant. And this ensures that any decisions made after are relevant and based on solid data. When we say hypothesis testing, we mean any change in KPI that we get having implemented an improvement. So the hypothesis could be a decrease in errors after implementing a Pokeyoak device. Or it could be as simple as the time spent collecting tools after a 5S project. Essentially, we, what we want to know is that the change is measurable and significant and not down to random variation. So let's look at an example that includes probabilities to help understand what we're trying to do. Let's say a bucket contains 10 red and 10 yellow balls, but you can't see inside the bucket. You shake it and you pick three balls at random, putting them back after you've made each pick. All three of them turn out to be red. Without taking statistical probabilities into account, you may make a comment or statement like, all the balls inside are probably red. Well, let's simply test this hypothesis. The probability of choosing one red ball is 50%. So the probability of choosing three in a row is 0.5 to the power of 3, which is 12.5%. Do you think that is statistically significant enough to conclude that it is likely right? Well, I wouldn't say so. However, if you chose five balls in a row and they were all red, then this probability is 3.1%, and I would say the statistical probability is probably significant enough to make that statement. It is much better to make statements like, with a confidence level of 95%, I can say that all the balls are red. And by saying it like this, you have stated the possibility that what you have included is in fact incorrect, and you have addressed the uncertainty. This is exactly what we're trying to do with hypothesis testing. Study the possibility of our result occurring and a set of confidence levels only over which our result is valid, otherwise it is null. Before we go on, I'll explain something called the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis assumes that whatever you are testing has no effect on the current output. It is almost like the innocent until proven guilty mindset. The null hypothesis is denoted by H0, and we always assume the null hypothesis is correct, until it is proven different. Then there is an alternative hypothesis, and that states that there is a difference between the output, denoted by HA or H1. A point to add is that you never prove the alternative hypothesis is true, but what you do is reject the null hypothesis, basically saying that there is a difference between groups. This will make a lot more sense when we look at an example, and I'll first run through the process, and then we'll go a lot deeper into how to calculate each factor and step along the way. So, if I found that the average time spent on my website with a white background was 20 minutes, and I wanted to increase the average time spent on the website by changing the colour of the background to blue, I could conduct an experiment and compare the statistics between the two results to conclude whether the change in background had any impact. The null hypothesis would state that the blue colour background would also have an average time spent of 20 minutes, i.e. the null hypothesis assumes the same result as before unless proven wrong. This is the basis for the null hypothesis. 
in science, you have to prove something has a significant effect as opposed to believing something and then proving it to be right. I can then state the alternative hypothesis, which is in this case that the average time spent on the website after the change to blue is greater than 20 minutes. You should always start by stating the null and alternative hypothesis. We will then follow the four remaining steps of the process. So step two is where we need to set a probability threshold, which is known as the significance level. The significance level uses the Greek letter alpha. For this case, we will select 0.05, which is a popular significance level to use. What this means is that when we collect a sample of viewing times from the new blue background, if we assume the null hypothesis is correct, and if that probability from the sample is lower than the significance level, i.e. less than 5% chance, then we can reject the null hypothesis. If the value from the same statistics is higher than the significance level, i.e. more than 5% chance of occurring, then we cannot reject the null hypothesis. Alternatively, you could select 0.1 or 0.2 as the significance level. It's up to you as the statistician. The next step is to actually take a sample from the viewers of the blue background and calculate the statistics. This includes things like the sample size, the mean and the standard deviation. The next step is to calculate the p-value, p standing for probability value. This is the probability that we get a statistic at least this far from the mean if we assume the null hypothesis is true. If the probability value is less than the significance level, then we have evidence to reject the null hypothesis and have evidence for the alternative hypothesis. If, however, the p-value is greater than or equal to the significance level, then we cannot reject the null hypothesis, i.e. we do not have enough evidence to reject it. All we are doing here is taking a sample from the blue background and saying, assuming the null hypothesis is correct, the probability of getting the results that we have gathered from the sample is let's say 3%, i.e. 3 in every 100. As we have set the significance level, the threshold, at 5%, 0.05, then the probability of getting the results, assuming the null hypothesis, is less than our significance level. In other words, the chance of getting the results we have is rarer, for that reason we can eject reject the null hypothesis. This is the basis for finding the significance and confidence that we are saying is correct. If I was to make the statement before doing these tests that the blue background definitely leads to longer viewer duration because the mean from the sample is higher, I've completely neglected the possibility that it was just a fluke, that the sample I took didn't happen to just be higher by chance. That is the real importance of doing this. You can start justifying decisions with evidence, exactly the same thinking with the problem solving that we've gone through, using data and facts to make more informed, better decisions. So let's work through this example with numbers and it should all become a bit clearer. Since we've completed steps one and two, we've stated the null hypothesis, the alternative hypothesis and the significance level. The significance level can be selected however you like, and the lower the value, the more confidence you have that your final conclusion is correct. Typically values are 0.05 or 0.01, which would be a confidence level of 95% or a confidence level of 99%. So now we need to calculate the statistics from our sample taken from the blue background population. We have 24 different recordings of time spent on the website, so our sample size, denoted by the lowercase n, is 24. The next thing we want to calculate is the mean time. This is denoted by x bar, showing it is a sample and the bar showing that it is an average. This is done by summing all the values and dividing it by the number of samples. So in this case our mean is 25. Finally, we need to calculate the standard deviation for our sample. We need to follow the formula and we get 7.126. The formula simply, you sum the differences between 
the recorded values and the mean. So it would be 10 minus 25 squared plus 14 minus 25 squared plus 26 minus 25 squared plus 28 minus 25 squared, etc. You keep going and then you divide it by the n minus 1, so sample size minus 1, and you square root the entire answer. And what you get is 7.126. The next thing to do is always draw your results so you can visualise what you are actually working out. We can assume that the standard deviation from the sample is the same as the standard deviation of the entire population. And we also assume that the population of samples follows a normal distribution shape. So drawing a normal distribution curve, we need to identify the probability, given the null hypothesis, that we would get the result we have away from the sample. To do that, we need to calculate the p-value. The p-value is calculated in two steps. Firstly, we need to calculate a z-value and then use a z-table to get the area under the curve which will represent the p-value. The z-value is 25 minus 20, so the new mean minus the hypothesis mean, divided by the standard deviation, divided by the square root of the sample size, and we get the answer of 3.44. Then looking at a z-table, which you can find online, we identify that the correlating p-value which is essentially the area shaded under the curve in red, is 0 0.00029, which is the same as 0.029%, meaning that assuming the null hypothesis, there is only 0.029% that we would achieve the results that we have got. Finally, since the p-value of 0.00029 is lower than the significance level, the alpha value. This practically means that, assuming the null hypothesis, there is very little probability that the same result would be achieved, less probability than the significance level. For this reason, we can, we can reject the null hypothesis and conclude that the blue screen does cause the screen time to increase. And that is the end of this module. It may seem daunting using alpha, z and p-values, but like anything else, the more you use it, the more comfortable you will become with this methodology. The main purpose of this module is to get that scientific thinking going, where you question results and you understand the statistical significance of them. As with every conclusion we make, there is a level of uncertainty and it's important to make sure that is brought to light.